Our next speaker is a philosopher of science and ethics whose interests in cognitive evolution have taken him into the natural and social sciences. His research focuses on how and why humans reason, think, and act the way they do. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher DiCarlo. Christopher? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to uh, thank Bill and everybody uh, involved with this conference for inviting me. It's certainly a, a pleasure to be here. I've met a lot of wonderful people, and this is a, certainly a beautiful city. My wife and I enjoy it very much. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about what I call the Big Five and the way in which people answer uh, these very, very important questions. Um, and in order to do that, I have to begin, uh, of course, with a bit of uh, shameless self-promotion. So, in July, I have this book coming out called How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass, A Critical Thinker's Guide to Asking the Right Questions. And asking the right questions, I think, is the focus about uh, this conference and many other conferences uh, similar in type. And the types of questions Nate certainly was considering. And if somebody were to ask, this is a, a book for a popular market. It's not necessarily a textbook for a university or whatnot. It's for anybody uh, to, uh, to try to better understand what's going on in terms of having these conversations with people. Somebody asked me, well, what is it? What, what's the book really about? And I said, well, it's kind of like a how-to book on the joys of cerebral sodomy. So, <laughs> I thought Bill would like that. So, it's not how to mind fuck your opponent or anything. <laughs> but, uh, I, I'm sorry, I had to get some jokes in following Nate, because that was pretty... <laughs> that, that hit home, so I'm going to try to bring things up a little bit. So, the idea is essentially this. I, wrote the book and divided it into three basic parts in which you could read either one of three parts. You can read the, the book in its entirety. And in part one, you get the ABCs and what I call the DEFs of critical thinking. And A is for argument. What is an argument? How do you put forward an argument? B is for bias. What are our biases? We all come with biases and preconceptions and ideas of how we see the world and so on and so forth. C is for context. We often forget the context. Nate wouldn't have experienced what he did if the context had been somewhat different. And I don't think Fred Phelps would have grown up the same way had he been born in Calcutta, or if he had born, been born somewhere else. He still would have had similar patterns of behavior, but the context being different, he might have turned out completely different. Right? The, the D stands for diagramming. You literally, I, I basically go over how you can diagram what the structure of your ideas looks like on paper and other people's ideas and their arguments, what, what they actually look like. E is for evidence. We certainly need to consider uh, the evidence that people put forward in basically supporting their views. And F deals with a series of fallacies, over two dozen different types of fallacies, which you can find in the arguments of others and, and in, in your own reasoning if you happen to commit them as well. The second part of the book deals with what I consider to be two of the greatest pains in the ass in, in all of history, Socrates and the ancient skeptics. And Socrates had a wonderful method, the Socratic method, in which to deal with uh, differences of opinions, different ideas, and so on and so forth. And so I lay out his particular method and how you can use these various tools from part one in order to have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue with people and, and important discussions. And the ancient skeptics put together these wonderful modes of reasoning that help them demonstrate that when somebody claims to have absolute truth, whether it's in a particular god or any other type of truth, these were very good tools. They had a number of tools that allowed them and us to show people that they don't quite measure up exactly. And in part three, I consider what I call the big five. And these, to me, are the five mo most important questions anybody can ask about themselves. What are the limits of my knowledge? Why am I here? What am I? How should I behave? And what is to come of me? And I think these are the, the, the five largest, biggest questions we can possibly ask ourselves because how we answer them tells us a great deal about ourselves. I don't know if you're familiar with speed dating, this new concept where people meet in bars for one minute 
uh, to three minutes, and they ask each other questions very, very quickly to try to find out, should I go on a second date with this person? What's this person really like, right? Well, ask them any of those or all of those, and you'll find out an awful lot about a person in a hurry, right? Because how we answer the big five trickles down and affects the way in which we answer other very important questions like uh, euthanasia and human rights and abortion and gay marriage and you know, law, punishment, uh, health care, and these types of things. So they're very, very closely connected. Now, the way I've seen it is basically that we can respond to these big five in a purely natural way or a purely supernatural way. Some people try to combine their responses with kind of a natural and supernatural way. But for the purposes of discussion in the book and for today, I'm going to keep these fairly opposite to see how people, in fact, address these uh, particular questions. Now, when we talk about natural, this deals with anything that can be observed and studied according to knowable laws that affect and and govern behavior, and these are things that can be observed and studied that exist in the physical world, and they range from the infinitesimally small to the astronomically uh, huge, and of course, everything in between. So it comprises anything and all that is found in nature. The supernatural refers to anything above or beyond what one holds to be natural. It literally means supra, to be above the natural. Now, there are two types of supernaturalism I deal with in the book. Theistic supernaturalism, topics ranging from gods and fairies and elves and gnomes and angels and the hereafter and ghosts and that sort of thing. And then the paranormal supernaturalism, you know, topics like uh, parapsychological or paranormal activity, psychic activity, clairvoyance, telekinesis, water dowsing, and that sort of thing. Today, I'm just going to deal with the theistic uh, supernaturalist approach. So, natural understandings of the Big Five tend to rely on things like common sense and science, logic, reason. It's empirical based. It uses our senses, our five senses, in order to make sense of the world. It's evidence based. It uses mathematics. And it uses and relies upon the criteria of consistency, parsimony or simplicity, and predictive success. In other words, it works. So it's concerned with the pragmatic aspects of life what really works, what builds bridges, what cures diseases, and so on and so forth. And it deals with levels, aspects of life I, I refer to at the level of the small t truth. The supernatural, on the other hand, often inquires, uh, makes inquiries involving faith-based accounts, and it requires what I call a reality measuring stick. And I'll refer to this throughout uh, the remainder of this talk. Supernatural accounts of the Big Five are concerned with aspects of life at what I call the Big T level of truth. So natural deals with a bottom-up approach, dealing with matters at what we would call small T level of truth, but supernatural accounts, that's the big stuff. That's the really, you know, absolute stuff. So there are two schools of thought when it comes to considering supernatural phenomena. One school believes that the subject matter of supernatural uh, phenomena lies outside the scope and can of the natural and scientific explanation. They believe that science, by definition, doesn't and cannot really study these types of matters. So Chris Mooney and Eugenie Scott, they would be in this particular camp. The others maintain that any supernatural claim that basically states that supernatural entities or powers intervene with the natural world, well, these now are open for scientific scrutiny and debate. So Blackford and Dawkins and Myers, they're more of this particular camp. So whenever a supernaturalist makes any kind of empirical claim, science has every right to investigate in, essentially, the attempt to confirm or falsify such a claim. So with Socrates and the ancient skeptics, what they found was that those who wished to answer the Big Five at this grandiose Big T level of truth in a supernatural way, they face a great deal of difficulty in trying to attain and demonstrate the perceived certainty of their answers. And why? Why is it so difficult to do this? And of course, the reason is because there's no such thing as a reality measuring stick. Or if there is, we don't yet have it. And when somebody makes an absolute claim, whether it's Fred Phelps or it's um, any particular person of faith, or any aspect of life where they maintain that what we believe is known for sure. And by the way, a couple of days ago, I just got off the phone 
with an associate of Harold Camping, whom I interviewed, and I have to thank you, Bill, for having this before the rapture started. <laughs> um, and I asked this person, how sure are you that the rapture starts May, 20, May 21st? Long weekend, Victoria weekend. And he said, I cannot be wrong. And I said, now, you realize you're making an empirical claim, and it can be falsified. And he says, no, it cannot. I said, what happens if I call you on May 22nd, and it's business as usual? Because what I was trying to find out from this gentleman is, if the world's coming to an end, essentially, I'll paraphrase it, can my charitable organization have your stuff? <laughs> if you're that sure, then what do you need your stuff for? So, how about it? No, because the Bible says, you know, and this, and I said, well, no, let's put the Bible aside. You're not going to need it. You're not, you're not going to need it. So, how about $5,000? Like, I was just trying to get anything out of this guy, and he wouldn't. He wouldn't give me a dime. How about a gentleman's bet? Just a gentleman's bet. Well, what would that include? I said, I'll call you May 22nd. So, he said, if you get a hold of me May 22nd, I will no longer be a child of God. I said, will you be willing to come over to the dark side then? <laughs> Can I interest you in a little atheism? A little cerebral sodomy? Hmm? And uh, he said, you will not be able to reach me on that day because there will be earthquakes and tsunamis the likes of which Japan could never have seen. So he's quite convinced of this. In order to demonstrate this to us, well, first of all, it's a, it's a metaphysical claim in the natural world. So I believe we can measure it. We don't need a reality measuring stick. But if he were to say things like, our view of God is the one and only true God, and so on and so forth, he's not bringing that down into the realm of small t truth. He's keeping it up, up in, up in the, the ether, so to speak. And so it remains protected because he doesn't have this, we don't have it, nobody can measure it, therefore he gets to say whatever he wants. So, if we look at the first question, what can I know? And we consider, well, what are natural responses to this? Well, essentially it goes like this. The limit, when I think of the limits of my knowledge, a natural understanding focuses on the complexities of constraints and variables and influences on the lives of ourselves and of other species. So a natural understanding considers complex relationships in the world in terms of systems analysis. Like this is really just the hard factual basis of, of what a natural description of our limits of knowledge really is. And so I've come up with these concepts known as the relations of natural and cultural systems. And they work kind of like this. The relations of natural systems is a nonlinear understanding of relationships based on causal factors discovered through the physical and the social sciences. They allow us to gain a better understanding of causality, cause and effect relationships, in an effort to better develop models and policies, hopefully for the more responsible management of human and natural resources. So I have a website that anybody can go to if they like, and it's expandable, therelationsofnaturalsystems.com, and I'll be adding to this as time goes on. And one of the interesting things that emerges is that we as a species develop what's known as biological equilibrium. That is to say, we're very comfortable with a certain stasis from the time we are born to the time we die. We develop this kind of equilibrium where we have this kind of comfort level. We're not alone in this. Every other species does this as well within their various ecological niches. So the relations of systems look something like this with us here. And if you ask yourselves, well, what am I made of? What, you know, you're essentially a big package of fleshy systems, right? You have a skeletal, muscular, endocrine, neural, immune. You have all these different types of systems. And if they're functioning in a particular way, you remain somewhat healthy. If we break each of those systems down, we, we find that they're made up of cells, which themselves contain genetic information, DNA, which tells the cells how to behave, which keeps the systems going in a particular way. And then DNA are large macromolecules themselves made up of atomic matter. And we smash these atoms, and we look at the underlying quarks and subatomic materials that they're made of. And now we're into the theoretical realm. Well, what is the ultimate bits that everything is made up of? And some believe it's super strings, and others believe it's something called quantum loop gravity. And if we go up into bigger systems, into ecosystems, and larger and larger systems, we find ourselves on a, 
uh, an entire world system without borders. So the pollution of one country goes over into another country and so on and so forth. And then our planet is one uh, amongst uh, seven others now. We kicked out Pluto. So we're in a planetary system around a star that is part of a huge cluster of stars known as a galaxy. All, that galaxy, the Milky Way, is inside of a huge galaxy cluster of systems, and all of those galaxy clusters, systems, millions of them represent all space-time. So here in a single uh, view, you get to see how we're related with all of these various types of systems. Well, just as there's lots and lots and lots of natural systems, there is a complexity of cultural systems as well. Our family, ethnicity, education, agriculture, religion, industry, and so on and so forth. In other words, lots and lots of what Richard Dawkins calls memes. Tons of memes that we evolve into and that we invent. Human artifacts, stuff, things, but even your ideas. And most importantly, the way in which our ideas answer the big five. So humans interact according to many complex relationships within these various cultural systems as well. So it follows that just as biological species, we have a biological equilibrium, we also have lots of cultural stuff, lots of memes. We develop what I call a mimetic equilibrium, a comfort level with our ideas, the clothes we wear, our hairstyle. You know, this week I look this way, next week I look like Justin Bieber or something, right? And so everybody has their own kind of way of doing things within these various complex uh, arrangements. So here's us again with our fleshy package of systems, and we have family and ethnicity, education, economics, politics, religion, agriculture, so, so many different types of system, communication, the arts, and whatnot. So lots of natural systems, lots of cultural systems. So to the extent of what can I know from a natural point of view, we marry these two systems, and we come up with this incredibly intricate ball I call the onion skin theory of knowledge. So you get the relations of natural systems with cultural systems embroiled together, and it makes for an incredibly complex interplay of both of these systems. That makes us and every other species system manipulators. So we try to exploit these various constraints that we can know about. What can I know about? I don't want to get cancer, okay? So I shouldn't eat Big Macs three times a day for the next five years, right? My, if I have an understanding that my family has, uh, 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 has a tendency for colon cancer, then maybe I should not do that. So we manipulate systems based on the level and extent of our knowledge of all of those interplays of systems. And we manipulate them in light of perceived value. Well, what do we value? What are the types of things we value? Freedom, liberty, life, living, non-oppression, various types of values. So the relationships between these onion skin layers, incredibly complex. So we can talk about issues in terms of how deep we can go into the onion. So if we were to have a discussion after this talk about quantum physics, and you're a quantum physicist, I'm only going to be able to go a few scant layers into that onion before that's it. And if you start talking mathematics, you've lost me, right? And the same thing works in terms of the breadth of my knowledge of quantum physics. There's only so many ways in which I can understand the connections between how quantum physics works and the very computer that's operating on those principles of quantum physics that is bringing you this lecture right now, where quantum physicists will be able to go much further around that onion. So I think it's a fairly helpful model for us to consider, from a natural point of view, what is the extent of our knowledge? Well, it's how well we can know the depth and breadth of all of those connections of natural and cultural systems. Now the supernatural response, the theistic supernatural response, is that people are in possession of absolute truth regarding the very nature of reality. This is no small bit of information. These people, billions of them, every day wake up believing that they have this particular type of knowledge. And you say, okay, interesting, so how do you know this? Well, it's guaranteed because their sources guarantee this, various books or texts or types of scriptures. They were told this, they were taught this by family members, clerics, imams, rabbis, priests, and so on and so forth. Or they could have personally experienced this through an epiphany or an act of, of revelation and whatnot. The problem with this type of, of, of knowledge is that if I don't have it, if I don't see it, how, how do they show it to me? 
without a reality measuring stick. Because a lot of people will just say, well, you're just not getting it. You're just not seeing the signs. It's all around you. God is there. You can see his work, his handiwork, all the time. There's something wrong with us who aren't getting it. What would, what would solve this is a reality measuring stick. Because watch how easily I can get universal approval in this room right now with a small t natural example. Okay? So, I have a pen. I'm going to hold it between my two fingers. And I'm going to open my fingers. What do you think will happen to the pen, sir? It will drop. That's a, how did you know that? That's a, oh, all right, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to open my fingers, and now you, ma'am, you tell me what's going to happen to this pen. It's going to drop. It's going to, you're psychic, obviously. You have some incredible power. Is there anybody here who maintains that the next time I open my fingers, the pen will not drop? That's the way you get universality. Because in my classes, I sometimes get a smart-ass student say, no, I don't think it will. <laughs> to which I respond, do you want a bet? <laughs> and that tends to quiet him up. Because if he says yes, I say, all right, I'll put up my house. <laughs> what do you have, sport? And I'm just teasing with him, of course. The one time the guy actually said, I'll put up my lack of respect, I guess. That you have for me. I'm sorry, sir, continue. You know, it was, it was kind of neat. When I, but here we have a very, very mundane example, but it shows an example where, look, we can have universal agreement at the small t level of understanding an aspect of the natural world. Is this absolutely true? No, because in the next five seconds, the laws of physics change and it doesn't drop. I'm willing to admit my ignorance and the limitations of my knowledge on that. So what do I say? I say, in all past times, it's dropped. And other things like it drop. And we come up with concepts called gravity to try to explain why these things behave the way they do within these natural and cultural systems. So that we don't have 100% absolute certainty. But as David Hume said, to paraphrase, so what? You don't need it to get out of the way of an oncoming car, right? You don't need it to tell yourself the next time you go swimming, go down really deep and inhale. <laughs> ah, right? So we can understand universals about the natural world. We don't need a reality measuring stick. The criteria we have works just fine. It's not absolute, but that's okay. You know, and I'm not saying absolute truth isn't important, and clearly it is to a lot of people. But what we need to do is set the record straight on this, because we seem to see a lot of discussions talking past each other. So I say in the book that this is really an attempt at fairness. That if you really want to have meaningful discussions on both sides, supernatural, natural, we got to be fair, and we got to say it like it is. Show me a reality measuring stick. Show me how your ideas measure up 100% on that and I believe you. You don't have a reality measuring stick, so I'm going to suspend judgment on that, and if you want, I can demonstrate why I think it is you are somewhat misguided in your views, because with the ABCs of critical thinking, I can demonstrate why some of your reasoning is lacking in particular ways and fallacious. So I can understand why you may hold those views now, but I'm going to make an effort to discuss them to show you as, as Nate said, to play devil's advocate, right? And to try to demonstrate to you, and we need this in society. Politicians need this. You need this when doctors are examining your health. You know, I know some people, whatever the doctor tells them, they just do it. They don't question it, they just do it. Now, obviously doctors are, are, are you know, study a long time, but they, they can be in error as well. And so this applies to a lot of different factors throughout life. So. That's basically the extent of what a supernaturalist will say, is it came to me, it was revealed, or it was told to me, or I've looked it up, or God would never lie, or whatever. In terms of understanding why I'm here, the natural response 
is that while the universe started about 13.72 billion years ago, our planet is about 4.6 billion years ago, and rightly one should say, okay, so how do you know this? How do you know the universe is this old, right? How do you know the planet's this old, and so on and so forth? So, what are a naturalist's premises upon which they base this particular belief, and what do they assume? What are their underlying assumptions? So, we say, well, the universe began with a Big Bang, 13.72 uh, billion years ago. Well, how do you know this? Well, you have Hubble's constant. You have the idea that when astronomers look at the galaxies everywhere in the universe, they're all going away from each other at the, kind of the same rate, like raisins would in a, in a rising loaf of baking bread. All the raisins relative to each other are moving away like the galaxies in our universe. And they can measure the rate at which they're doing this. <coughs> so that's one way, of course, there's the, the CMBR, the Cosmic micro Microwave Background Radiation. Everywhere radio telescopes point we get the same consistency of background radiation from the point at which the universe had essentially inflated and is now moving out and moving out and moving out and moving out with the same intensity. There are, of course, other premises and other assumptions. Those are just two that I, I brought into it. But a supernaturalist will say, well, this doesn't tell us why we're here. Sure, there was a Big Bang, but who caused the Big Bang, right? You could say, well, okay, the simple answer is a tautology. We're here because we're here. In other words, we got lucky. We could have just as easily not been here. No buildings, roads, techno technology, or the ice capades, right? Nothing here whatsoever. <coughs> so, but how could something come from nothing? And you probably get this a lot when you have discussions with theistic people. There had to have been a god to kickstart everything. Something can't come from nothing. Nihil ex nihilo, as the medievals used to say, nothing comes from nothing. You, ha you have to have something to start, the, which doesn't make sense anyhow. How did God be forever, right? What caused him, right? It, it's your, it's your, your grade school question that my son asked when I was in a, in a debate once with, with a, a Christian gentleman. He said, what, what caused God? Well, nothing. Well, then why couldn't the universe come from nothing? Nope, can't happen. Okay, so how can something come from nothing? And it's, it's basically time to quote Morpheus from The Matrix. Try to relax. This may seem a little weird. The, the lambda cold dark matter model is what quantum, is what physicists use right now to help explain how something can come from nothing. I have no pretenses about knowing much about what I'm about to say, more than a few layers into the onion. This is basically from Lawrence Krauss. Prior to the existence of our universe, the nothing that existed actually allowed for unusual space-time quantum fields. Accordingly, the smallest amount of volume allowed by quantum mechanics within what's called a linear Planck length, the smallest unit measurable, is the volume of 10 to the minus 99 cubic centimeters. So point zero, 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 99 zeros, and then a one cubic centimeters. Very, very, very tiny. The largest amount of mass that could fit inside this unbelievably small cube of theoretical space without collapsing into a black hole is a speck of matter weighing one one hundred thousandths of a gram. According to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, this matter can come into being for a very short period of time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, point zero 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 forty three zeros one of a second. How fast? There, it, no, faster than that, right? <laughs> Incredibly fast. Physicists believe that if this amount of space and matter come into existence simultaneously with a particular type of scalar field, then the universe can successfully be created. And then something called inflation, a period when the scalar field divides space into a brief period of extreme exponential expansion. How extreme? Producing an enormous amount of matter, estimated to be 10 to the 85 grams. Okay? Lots of zeros after that one. Right? Huge amount. What started as an infinitesimally small bit of virtual en energy has now become all matter and energy in the expanding universe, yet the total energy of the universe is within a quantum fluctuation equaling nothing. 
I told you. <laughs> it's weird. But that's how you get a natural explanation of something coming from nothing. At least a quantum fluctuation in a negative vacuum is the best explanation that physicists have come up with now. Now, that may change in the next 20 years. I don't know. My knowledge only goes a few layers into the onion. We'll have to get Lawrence Krauss back here to help us out with that. Why am I here? The supernatural response? God did it. Moving on. <laughs> Billions of people, from Jews to Christians, Muslims to Hindus, they all believe that the reason they're alive today is due to a particular divine power which willed their existence into being. But where do we start when there are so many different versions of a supernatural human creation? From Aztecs to Zoroastrians, there are literally thousands of ways in which humans have attempted to answer this question of why we're here in a supernatural context. Which one is right? So many mythologies. Eskimo cultures, first man falling from a pea pod, raven meeting him, nourishing him, feeds and nourishes him. Then they make everybody else out of clay. All the other animals are made out of clay. Then he introduces her to woman. From first man and woman, the world becomes populated. Don't like that? Let's move on. Syro-Babylonian -Bab culture, 7th century BCE. Life emerges from the sea in the form of two snakes. Lakmu and Lakamu give birth to the first man, Anshar, and the first woman, Kishar. Egyptian cultures. There is only a chaotic scene of bubbling water called Nu. Out of Nu comes Ra on a blue lotus flower. He appears on the surface, gives light to the universe, creates the air god, his wife, the goddess of moisture, birth to the sky goddess, the earth god, thus creating the physical universe. Don't like that? How about something in a Greek myth? Zeus, Poseidon, Hermes? Or we can just have the Romans rip them off and call them other names, <laughs> Jupiter, Neptune, Vulcan. Or we can have Norse myths with Odin, New movie, Thor, yay, yay. Balder et al, Japanese myths, right? Homosubi, Inari, Izanagi, lots and lots and lots of different myths. How about this one? The Old Testament takes six days for everything to come into being, and then humans come along, Adam and Eve, but which account? We get two accounts, one where they're both created simultaneously, one where Adam's created first, and then Eve comes along as a rib, right? And these are not that far apart in Genesis. The Quranic version has Adam, who figures very prominently, and Eve comes along kind of as an afterthought. And then there are dozens of aboriginal accounts, the great sky woman, the sun and earth, the two brothers, and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of aboriginal accounts of creation myths. So many, they cost me a job at a university for saying, essentially, we are all African. But we can discuss that a little bit later. It's logically impossible for every supernatural account to be true, but it is logically possible that every one of them could be false. What account, amount of truth, if any, could be attributed to any of these various creation myths that have developed over the last several thousand years? We have no reality measuring stick. So they lie outside of the realm of natural examination, and those that do, they inject faith as justification along with tradition and custom and so on. If they make claims within the realm of natural examination, they can be falsified. Scientology. Xenu, a galactic overlord, flies a bunch of aliens to Earth on DC-8s and drops them into volcanoes and then blows volcanoes up using hydrogen bombs 75 million years ago. Okay, you've entered into the natural realm, Tom Cruise. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> And what we can say to Mr. Cruz is, okay, you're making a natural claim, so we can use science. And this is how science works. You've made a claim that something occurred. Therefore, you make a prediction that we should be able to do core samples in the Earth and do radiometric dating to determine the level at 75 million years all around the Earth, and we should be able to find components that should not be there. So if there's still half-lifes of radioactive decay because of all these hydrogen bombs that went off, we should be able to measure what that level of radioactive uh, decay is. These bombs must have been contained in some kind of material that should be along with those as well. Uh, exhaust fumes from these DC-8 alien ships, all of this should be present. And yet when we look, and many don't actually go looking for it, but we do check at the 75 million 
uh, Mark, and we don't find anything out of the ordinary. And in that way, science then falsifies a supernatural claim that has been brought into the natural realm. That's how science works. That's kind of like uh, a, a way of ideas saying, bring it, biatch. You know, it's kind of like, if you say this, fine. But now you've brought it into the natural world where we're going to use the tools of science to be able to falsify your claims. And if it's not falsifiable, it ain't science. But it must be science. It has the name right in the, in the, in the religion, right? I'm not even going to get into ray aliens. We can talk about them at the break. No empirical evidence for the existence of any such deities has ever been scientifically demonstrated. Obviously, no modern-day miracles or divine interventions have ever, been, have ever passed such tests of verification. So if we consider then, what am I? The natural response is we go from prokaryotes to eukaryotes to invertebrate fish to vertebrates to reptiles, mammals, ground squirrels, common ancestor for chimps and hominins, australopithecines, homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens, to Donald Trump. <laughs> now, some of you might see this evolutionary chain and say, hang on to Carlo. I don't think Donald Trump is that far evolved from pond scum. <laughs> I think you've given him too much credit in here. By the way, Donald, you're fired. <laughs> so this is essentially how naturalists look at the world. So we have the Earth coming into being 4.6 billion years ago, and it's a billion years before any life comes on the scene. A billion years before any life comes on the scene. It took its time. But from inanimate matter comes matter. And it comes in the form of the most simple, one-celled organisms. And then they develop nuclei. And then they become more and more complex. Because eventually, from photosynthesis, they develop the capacity to develop energy from the sun. But they are asexually reproducing. Once sexual reproduction comes along between a billion billion point four years ago, based on the fossil records, that causes an immense explosion of life, what I sometimes call the second Big Bang. <laughs> so with the advent of sex, you get an enormous amount of diversity, tons and tons of diversity. And so this speeds up a bit. In evolutionary terms, it speeds up. So hundreds of millions of years as opposed to billions of years. And here we are with Australopithecines, roughly about 7 million years ago, to Homo sapiens sapiens about 200,000 years ago. Through continental drift, we had singular landmass known as Pangaea, which split into two, Gondwana land and Laurasia. There have been numerous major extinctions. The Permian extinction alone, 250 million years ago, decimated the, the, the planet and killed 90% of marine and at least 75% of all land species. Gone. It took millions of years to recover from that. And this is only one of seven major extinctions that we know about. They've happened a lot. Today, a lot of people don't know this, don't realize it. 99% of every species that ever existed is now extinct. Thousands and thousands of macro and microevolutionary changes and climate changes has led to the development of a species such as our own which has been able to realize that our ancestry lies in Africa. And in this way, we truly are all African. I've written an article uh, for Free Inquiry with the same title. And if you want all of as much evidence as, as you would need for any intelligent discussion, uh, you, you can find it in that particular article. And I make some inferences as well, that if we can accept the fact that we are all African, it immediately makes us all equal. It's egalitarian. It liberates us from the concepts of having to ascribe self-importance to us because we happen to believe in a particular God and we belong to a particular in-group or a special VIP club as the chosen people. And it also means that ra racism is a human invention because essentially there is no difference between us. You might have ethnic differences that are wonderful to celebrate, but only because that's what developed after we all left Africa and gain different types of geological, ethnic identities. So what am I? I'm the ancestor of an African ape. The supernatural response 
It depends on which one you choose. The common understanding is that humans are made up of two parts, the physical body and this kind of spiritual part that dwells within. This is known as dualism, dual, two things. The human is made up of two things. Empirically or scientifically, there have been a grand total of zero accounts of observing anything remotely close to what we might call a soul. Nah, hang on. You can't see a soul, says the supernaturalist. Such a tactic incorporates what's known as the insulation technique of protecting the claim from the very possibility of testing it scientifically or empirically. It's there. Is it? Really? How do you know? Well, I know. How? It says in this book, and this guy told me, and I just feel it. Don't you feel it? No. Actually, I don't. Because this just turns out to be another example of what's known as Russell's teapot, or the flying spaghetti monster, or dragons in my garage, or invisible pink unicorns. And what this means is, if you claim there's a soul, but you have no reality measuring stick, and we have no way of testing for this thing, then I get to say all kinds of things exist. And you cannot say they do not. Remember, we have to keep the onus of proof exactly where it belongs, right? Because these all violate the Sagan principle, what I call the Sagan principle. They are extraordinary claims, but they lack an extraordinary evidence. And so I get to say whatever I want. And because you can't falsify it, it exists, right? Done. It doesn't quite work that way. Without a reality measuring stick, you can't demonstrate the reality of these things. You can believe them all you want, but then I can believe in magical flying squirrels, and I can believe in all kinds of things, talking moose, right? Rocky and Bullwinkle. I can, I can think of all kinds of things. So here's just a few problems with souls, and there's a few of them, so I'll go through them fairly rapidly. The problem with souls is this. If a soul is physical, then it would have to comply to physical laws. If it's not, how does it interact with a physical body in a physical world? Daniel C. Dennett refers to this as the Casper the Friendly Ghost example. On some occasions, Casper flies through walls. Ta-da! On other occasions, he picks things up. Ta-da! Well, which is it, Casper? I mean, <laughs> you, how do you get to do both, right? Because a lot of people define souls as being immaterial. They're immaterial. You can't see them, can't measure them, can't know anything about them. They don't comply to the physical world but they make decisions for you? Oh, yes. And they survive bodily death. Uh-huh. How do you know this? Read the book. Right? <laughs> so, how does the soul originally come into being? Remember, the subtitle of the book is A Critical Thinker's Guide to Asking the Right Questions. Here's a pile of questions people who believe in souls need to be asked. And not necessarily in a nasty manner, but just for clarification, like Socrates would. He would say, souls, interesting, fascinating. Tell me more about this concept of soul that you have. Okay, well then tell me this. How can it not apply in the physical world and apply to the physical world at the same time? And then you wait for people to explain. And then you say, okay, how does a soul originally come into being? Were souls created at the beginning of the universe or do they get as per needed, you know? Have they always existed? Will they always exist? What happens to the souls of miscarried fetuses? Do they become supernaturally recycled? Is God a green soul recycler? Right. Does the soul change at any time? For example, when children die at a very young age, do their souls mature after death, or are they always young, forever and for all time? Does the same apply for the severely mentally challenged? Do their souls gain knowledge and insight after death? Or will they be mentally challenged souls? Where exactly do they reside? And what do they do for eternity? Do they sit on clouds and play harps? Do they haunt the physical world in shadowy dimensions? Do they have afterlife parties? <laughs> According to some faiths, like Islam, why does sex play so prominently? in the afterlife if they don't interact with the physical world? How do you get that stimulation? How can there be physical pleasure in an immaterial world? It's a tough one, though, by worldly measures and not altogether undesirous one. Welcome to heaven, the perpetual orgasm. <laughs> Is the existence of souls empirically testable? Do they weigh 21 grams? Do you know of this doctor who did this? Yeah. He would have people die on a scale? And they're 21 grams lighter. There goes the soul. 
If so, right, how should we be able to confirm their existence? We should be able to confirm them. If not, then the insulation tactic is again used along with an obvious violation of the Sagan principle, so we're back again to the reality measuring stick problem yet again. But nobody said finding absolute truth was going to be easy. Question four, how should I behave? The natural response. Well, how should I behave deals with the field of philosophy known as ethics, the study of how and why we value human behavior or actions. And values are estimations of worth we place on specific actions, or in some cases, of inaction. And these are measured in various ways, right? Good, bad, right, wrong, fair, and unfair. This is often associated with rules and rewards and punishments. And acts that are highly valued tend to be rewarded, and those that aren't are, are punished. So we have prisons and that sort of thing. Now, there are codes of conduct in other species as well, like chimpanzees and meerkat. They have codes of conduct. You're a member of a, of a particular chimpanzee group, and you don't act in accordance to a specific uh, pattern of behavior, you will be punished in various ways. And there are all kinds of different ways, from ostracizing an individual to physically harming that individual, to keeping levels of food away from that individual. So there are codes of conduct in other species aside from humans. For us, we need to consider the onion skin theory of knowledge and the concept of free will. This is, to me, the most fascinating part of human ethics. And I'm going to use what's called the Sorites argument to demonstrate the control we have over our wills, our volitions, and our desires. How much control do we really have? Okay. So let's say I want to create a heap. Sorites is just Latin for heap. Let's say I wanted to create a heap of rice on this stage, almost as high as the ceiling. But I do it one grain of rice at a time. Okay. Now, there's nothing on the stage, so you would say, there's no heap. And if I piled 10 truckloads on the stage, you would say, that's a heap. But if I were to do it one grain of rice at a time, clearly it would go through a transitional stage of not being a heap to becoming a heap to being a heap. Right? So it would look like this. So I'm fascinated in ethics with the amount of control people have over, they over how they behave. How much control did Fred Phelps have in treating his wife and his kids that way? Right? Where do we put the blame? If you're a supernaturalist, you say, guy's got a bad soul. He is going to get fucked up in hell. <laughs> right? That's what's going to happen to him. But a naturalist is going to say, I, I don't see a soul. I don't know of any such thing. So when I act in a particular way, we had uh, lunch this aft. Great lunch, by the way. Tomato soup or uh, minestrone type soup. Wraps, croissants, sandwiches and whatnot. What one did you choose? How free were you to choose that? How many factors from the natural and cultural systems came together on this day for you to arrive at that table and say, ham and cheese, oh yeah, that's what I'm eating, right? How much control or lack thereof did you have in making that decision? So in ethics, I'm very much interested in the mechanics so this movement from not being a heap to becoming a heap is what I call the umbra of becoming. It's the most interesting part of understanding ethics. Clearly, when there's no control, we can understand this in ethics. Somebody has a mental health issue. A woman suffering from postpartum psychosis takes her young child and jumps in front of a subway train, killing them both. Dr. Suzanne Killinger Johnson, 1999, St. Clair Subway Station, Toronto, Ontario we would say, well, how much control did she have, right? Vince Lee kills and decapitates a young man on a bus in Manitoba and eats part of him. How much control? Well, legally, they said, very little. You're not being sentenced for first-degree murder. He was suffering from schizophrenia. He believed God told him to do this because the gentleman sitting next to him was the devil. And he had to eat him because the devil can reconstitute, can reanimate itself. In his mind, that's consistent. That made sense. Right? So how much control did he have? How much control did you have choosing your lunch today? And what about this weird kind of, you know, umbra of becoming area 
where we sort of have control, but not quite. Exactly who or what is control when it comes to making ethical decisions? For supernaturalists, there's this notion of dualism, while the soul makes these decisions, right? But for naturalists, there's just the physical matter. So within these complexities of randomness, this Byzantine network of the onion skin theory of knowledge, where lies moral blame or moral praise? Are we nothing more than a conglomerate of complex matter influenced by the indefinite numbers of constraints acting in accordance to random chance? This seems rather bleak to some, and yet it may in fact turn out to be the case. And if it were, what then? Is there anything we can do about it? What would happen if science eventually reveals that we have very little, if any, control over our actions? How might our systems of governance change? Politics, law, education would all need to account for randomized behavior under currently known constraints. Concepts of good and evil might become purely matters of chance or luck. To admire the creativity of an accomplished violinist would be to appreciate his or her luck. You had the right genes, the right temperament, and so on and so forth. To attribute blame to a criminal would involve the realization of a series of unfortunate natural and cultural incidents. This is not a license to behave relati rel uh, relativistically in whatever manner we choose. We cannot simply act in any manner we desire and claim to be faultless simply because of the complexities of the Oz talk. So you can't leave this lecture and go out onto the street and say, wonderful lecture by DeCarlo. Wasn't that interesting? Oh, look, a kitty. <laughs> right? Couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. The constraints just, yeah. But we also need to think in the umbra of becoming, of control, wherein lies our capacity to recognize that as humorous because we, we find it abhorrent because it causes pain to another animal and suffering. And how, mu how much of that is simply because we are able to control our desires, wills, and volitions to some extent. Simply a more honest model of understanding value in light of a much broader account of influencing constraints. And that's where I think science and philosophy can come together to try to better understand why we behave the way we do. And so now the really hard work begins, right? So it's really a make work project for myself and my colleagues. But um, so we need to try to understand the level at which these individuals were or were not in control of their capacities with regard to the treatment of themselves and others. You've got a, an uncle, you love him, he's a wonderful man, and you find out he's a pedophile. And you hate that, and you hate what he does to children, and you despise that, but you still love your uncle, and you want to try to understand why does he do that, and he wants to understand why he does that, right? So that's why we need a better system of trying to understand how all of these factors, these constraints, influence human behavior so we can help people, so we can be more compassionate, but it's gonna require us to bring the sciences together in with laws and morality and a better understanding of why humans behave the way they do. To a significant degree, we have been cognizant of what makes us tick, and the human machine has a very good understanding of these complexities of its properties, its evolved properties. So when we understand ourselves this way, we gain a better understanding of all of these constraints and to which degree we are in control or lack control of our actions. So how should I behave? Short answer, as ethically as possible under the circumstances. Some guiding principles, things like the golden rule, the no harm principle, and the T-hip law. T-hip law, what's that? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's something I've put together called the Tolerance Harm Inverse Proportion Law. If we have degree on the y-axis and time on the x-axis here, and we have people acting in a particular way here, and our level of tolerance measured in high degree up here, as long as the level of harm is relatively low, our level of tolerance is pretty high. It's once people's beliefs start to generate harm that our tolerance goes down and down and down. And here, is where Nate Phelps decides he's had enough and he's leaving because he's perceived that level of harm to be unacceptable and intolerable. And we can use this as a map to try to understand better what it means when people act and behave in the way we do and then we have value judgments about that type of behavior. The supernatural response, I'll wrap things up very quickly, Bill. <laughs> So many commandments, guidelines,
various types of warnings, rules, and so on. Commonalities among supernaturalists, right? Act in ways favorable by your God and you get rewarded. You get an afterlife or you get recycled. Right? Act in ways unfavorable doesn't work out so well. Why do you behave ethically as a supernaturalist is not necessarily because it's intrinsically good. It's because you're getting a pat on the back. You gain an advantage. It's something I call a metaphysical annuity. You pay into this metaphysical pension by doing good deeds, and God goes, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Welcome. Ho, oh, ho, look at the interest you've gained in being such a good person, right? So, commonalities. The golden rule and the no-harm principle figure very prominently through a lot of world religions. There's no question about it. But the main difference is this notion of goodness in itself and what's in it for me approach. Finally, what is to come of me? The natural response. Two ways of responding to this question. What is to come of me while I'm alive and what happens to me after I die? Well, while I'm alive, it's the onion skin theory of knowledge. Very complex. So it's really luck. There's a lot of randomness and choice, but there are causal clusters which I can try to make some decent decisions within. How much free will and how much control do I have? This new field of epigenetics is fascinating. What your grandparents and great-great-grandparents ate and the stress levels they experienced and whatnot may actually be affecting the way in which your genes express or do not express. And after we die? Well, nothingness. But what would that be like, Thea say? Well, that's horrible. What would that be like? Many have difficulty imagining what this would be like. So here's a thought experiment you can ask people. Do you remember what your existence was like 50 years before you were born? Yeah, it'd be just like that. <laughs> so the supernatural response of what is to come of me. For billions of people, there seems to be a great need to believe that there really is something more than just this life, right? For if there's absolutely nothing forever and for all time after we depart from this wonderful earth and life, the universe and you and me and the music of Bach and Mozart and the cathedrals of St. Paul and Westminster Abbey, sunsets of Bombay, the majesty of the Andes, the splendor of the Great Barrier Reef, all of these things will in the grand scheme of things have meant nothing. The millions who died in wars fighting for what they believe to be valiant and dignified causes will have been for nothing. The love that you feel, have felt, and will feel for those you care most deeply about, all those moments will be lost in time, like tears and rain. A naturalist does not see this realization as hopeless, but as liberating and attempts to create the best possible world for himself or herself and all other species on this planet in a limited time available while occupying this world. For this is not all for nothing. This is all there is, and this is everything. Why is the state of nothingness perceived by some to be such a bad state? Why is sleeping forever such a bad thing? First of all, you won't be around to piss and moan that you're not around. <laughs> okay? Second, everyone could catch up on some sleep. Just think of how rested we'll all feel when never comes around again. <laughs> and finally, it's the great equalizer. No special afterlife club where chosen ones get VIP treatment. No eternal bliss. <clears throat> no reward for all the sacrifices made in this life. No 72 virgins where applicable. See manual for details. There's just nothing. For many supernaturalists, it just seems easier to hope through faith rather than accept the perceived unfavorable alternative of nothingness. The appeal of an afterlife touches a very old and very tenacious part of the brain, the limbic system. This is the emotional center of the brain, and it has been around in our ancestors' heads a lot longer than our developed abilities to reason and to think logically. So it should not come as much of a surprise to see so many people on this planet accept supernatural claims, even in the face of logically and empirically inconsistent evidence. Know what you are up against with a supernaturalist. Their mimetic equilibrium is such that they do not want it to be disrupted. They're comfortable there. They like where they are. So many descriptions of an afterlife. No reality measuring stick. A psychological need to want the party to continue. Who wants to go home too soon, right? The party's just getting going. PZ Myers just got here, right? Things are going to be interesting now. 
Billions of people on this planet believe with absolute certainty that they are in possession of the correct answers to the big five. So many millions of people have abandoned the skeptical and Socratic ideas, so clearly demonstrate our lack of knowledge and suggest a genuine acceptance of humility in realizing our shortcomings to knowledge at this big T level of truth. How different the world might be if all we ever worried about were natural matters at the small t level of truth. Imagine, just imagine. Thank you.